let's just get going. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the July 2022 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Um, let's start with uh, introductions. I will do my best as usual, and I will manage to mess it up. Uh, Jeff, could you start us off, please? Uh, Jeff Jones, um, I guess at large, ex-BSP. Great. Thank you. Grant? Hi, my name is Grant. Um, panel scribe. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Tyler. Good evening, everybody. Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director for DCFFSD, and I am the commissioner designated appointee to this group. Great. Thank you. Jessica. Hi everyone, uh, Jessica Brown, she, her, hers, uh, assistant professor of law and associate director of the Center for Justice Reform at Vermont Law and Graduate School, at large appointee to the panel. Thanks. Thanks. Elizabeth. Elizabeth Morris, a juvenile justice coordinator at FSD. Great, thanks. Evan. Evan Meenan from the Department of State's Attorneys. Great. Barb. Barb Kessler with the State Police. And I Great. have no power, so that's why I have no lights. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great evening. Yeah. Rebecca and friend. <laughs> Hi, uh, Rebecca Turner from Defender General's office. Uh, I'm sitting beside. Um, a deputy defender general. Hi, I'm Marshall Paul. I'm the chief juvenile defender. Great. Thanks for coming. Welcome. Jennifer Pullman. Hello, all. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Pullman. I'm the executive uh, director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Thank you. Thank you. Um, phone number that begins with 34. It's in, in the 802 area code. Yep, that's uh, Christopher Loris, a uh, research associate with Crime Research Group. And disclosure, also a member of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, not here wearing that hat. Great, thank you. Judge Zone. Hi, Judge Tom Zone. I am the Chief Superior Judge in Vermont. And we are getting one heck of a storm over here right now. So I'm not uh, sure how long I'll have power. And activity it's going to be one of those evenings i think <laughs> robin hello this is robin joy director of research crime research group um also having weather issues and a german shepherd that's trying to sit on my lap because she's afraid so understood yes. hi ching hi uh i'm Ting Ren, Evaluation and Program Analyst at Shelburne Farms. Uh, I'm a community member on the panel appointed by the Director of Racial Equity. Great. Susanna. Hello, Susanna Davis, Executive Director of Racial Equity for the state. Thank you. Uh, Jen Furpo. Hey there, Jen Furpo from the Vermont Police Academy. Great. And According to my screen, I've gotten everyone. If I miss somebody, announce yourselves, please. It's impossible that I did that. All right, it's not. <laughs> Great, welcome. Okay, announcements. Do, does anyone have any that they'd like to put forth at the beginning? Okay, Monica is, oh, go ahead, Susanna. Hi, I am going to cheat because I have to look at the whiteboard over there, so I won't be looking at you, but I just wanted to update this group. Um, 
as you all know, a number of criminal justice related study groups and working groups were just created by, um, did we already talk about this? Not that I remember. Okay, then I just wanted to make sure that you all are on notice that there's a lot of analysis getting underway right now about disparities in different aspects of criminal justice and law enforcement. So there is the um, uh, Julio database study committee happening and the um, traffic regulation group that has been assembled to determine which traffic offenses can be moved to secondary enforcement. Um, there is another one having something to do with uh, law enforcement data collection that also came out of S250. I'm flagging this here because some of these are temporary, quite temporary. Um, and so it may end up coming back to this group in the coming months when those findings happen. And I have to note that the chair of one of those groups is in this room, and I'm very grateful to Evan for agreeing to take that on um, for the Julio Database Study Committee. So I just wanted to make sure that people in this room know that uh, in a few months, some of those findings are going to happen, and I don't know if it makes sense to have, uh, you know, for us to talk to those other groups since there's considerable overlap, but that's the case. It probably does. I mean, I know that you and I, Susanna, are both doing the 250 one, so I hadn't even thought of it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, Monica cannot be here this evening. Uh, that's the one announcement I have. Um, otherwise, I wanted to simply raise the issue of chat etiquette during our meetings. Um, what happened last month was I was splitting, and this may be a matter of my own density and age, but I there was I had to split concentration so many ways to watch the chat, help facilitate the conversation, um, see if anyone's coming in late, and then also monitor. Oh, I said that monitor the chat. I was really confused, and what ended up happening is Chief Stevens wanted to get in the meeting, and I didn't let him in because I didn't know he was there. So I'd like to ask if. If someone has a statement, just make the statement. It doesn't necessarily need to go into the chat. It ends up feeling a little like side conversations in an in an in-person meeting that a couple people are sitting off on the corner and talking and nobody knows what's going on. So I would actually recommend, if we could, that if you have something to state, just state it. If you need to put a reference into the chat, great, but please just also say that you've done that. Um, the other issue with that is that it helps Grant with um, keeping the transparency of this group going. Uh, because of course, we he can just say this is in the chat, but that has no meaning if someone's reading the minutes. So I would just ask if we could do that. Uh, Susanna, you had your hand up, but you took it down. Did you, do you still I want was, it down? I was gonna ask if you would find it helpful to have somebody who could be the tech monitor during meetings in case there's someone in the waiting room or something. That would help, yes. That would help enormously. And we should, who, if any, Anybody wants to do it, please just identify yourself and let people in. It's not it. that big. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's not that big a task, but it it it's important. And I just I felt horribly last month that he wrote me an email after the meeting and just said, you know, I I tried, but I couldn't. And that was on me. So anyway, I would just ask if we could do that with the chat um, and not actually chat in the chat. <laughs> um, and that's all that I have for announcements. Um, we can move on to the approval. 
correction, whatever, of the minutes from last month. Oh, Jess. Instead of putting it in the chat, I think that, um, and I totally agree with everything you said about using the chat in big meetings like this. I think that Sheila might have joined. I texted oh. her. And so, oh, yeah, good. I think Sheila's here and she asked if we had done introductions, so. Sheila, go for it. Okay, thank you so much, Jessica, for the text. So much has transpired in the last hour that I would just spaced it a little bit. Um, Sheila <laughs> Linton, she, her, hers. I am appointed by the Attorney General at-large community member and representing the Root Social Justice Center, centering blackness. Happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay. Um, the minutes. The minutes. Addenda, corrections, deletions. All right, seeing none, I'd love to entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt the minutes from the June 14th, 2022 RDAP meeting. Great, thank you. Anyone seconding? I can second, this is Sheila. Great, thank you. Any discussion beyond this? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please signify somehow. Aye, raise your hands, do both. Aye. 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 Great. Aye. All opposed? No, all abstentions. I'll abstain, Tyler, I wasn't here last time. Got it, thank you. And the minutes pass as submitted. And again, Grant, thank you very much for all that you do. Okay, continuing onward. We started all those wonderful discussions last month and we started them. We didn't by any means get to finish them. So I wanted to continue that discussion as I said in the letter that I sent out um, before this meeting. And what I thought to do was to begin with the second look subcommittee because Rebecca got kind of crammed in at the end and um, we didn't really, we were like, you know, get it in, hurry up. <laughs> so I wanted to start with her and then I wanted to move into the juvenile justice um, subcommittee, me, uh, subcommittee's thinking. And that's when um, we'll have Robin Joy present a bit as well. And then finish up with the community safety reviews, except I think Witchy has asked, Witchy, I got this right, didn't I? You're gonna wait until next month to do it, correct? I think his generator may have. Yeah, he's not here. <laughs> he's not here. Anyway, I think we're waiting on that. So, Rebecca, do you want to go ahead? Hi, uh, thanks, Aitan. Um, so, right, so there was a second look subcommittee, got some final minutes, and I got some word words in last month. So I don't wanna take up too much time, but I, I wanna make sure everyone has a sense of what the subcommittee did and also to hear sort of the pieces that we landed upon recognizing within that subcommittee specific areas within the general concept that we were had identified as either uh, places that other jurisdictions, state, federal, um, or model legislation relating to second look were going. And um, I'd love to hear any reactions as to any particular places within the second look uh, field are of interest, um, but we can we we can um, go further into further detail later. And then just to clarify, because I think there were some questions as to whether or not second look subcommittee met since the last time. We have not, so there hasn't been another meeting, sort of on hold to to have this discussion. Um, I think there was my recollection is there was general agreement that to move forward in this area. So hoping yes. tonight 
to um, delve into, again, the specific points within and to get a sense what, if any, areas within this are of particular interest with this group. And then going from there, a subcommittee can, can meet and um, hopefully come together with something, uh, if not next month, then September. Um, I also wanted to clarify a time, uh, you know, Marshall is here and I'm really excited that he's been able to join us tonight. Uh, I did not intend, although he's welcome to <laughs> join in and, and, and add his thoughts on the second look generally. He certainly was not a part of that subcommittee that met, um, but what I was hoping, knowing that we were going to touch down on the juvenile justice data uh, more deeply for this month, I wanted to make sure that our juvenile defender uh, got to come and share with you guys his perspectives being part of that system. Uh, and, and My mistake. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to, to, to share that, but let me, let me kick this off and hopefully not take up too much time because a lot of people are going to say a lot of things to share. So when we last met, and, and, and I, I should say the members, uh, if everyone has them in mind, Evan, uh, Meenan, Aaron, Jacobson from AGO, Wichi, Artu, Eitan, myself. Is there anyone else on that subcommittee that I'm missing who was there? Not and that I can think of. And any, I was there. This is a thing I was there too. Oh, yes. Sorry, excuse me. And and I know Jess Brown had wanted to join and couldn't make it. For future, if you're interested, just shoot me an email and I'll make sure you're included on, on, on future meetings. Um, what we talked about was how the landscape around second look legislation first here in Vermont um, before we went elsewhere. And where we started was looking at what we call sentence reconsideration laws uh, as enacted in current Title 13, 70, 42, sentence reviews. And right now that statute uh, as written provides very specific narrow circumstances for a second look reconsideration of the sentence after it's been imposed. Uh, the one that came up recently for review initially by sentencing commission, uh, which voted in support of it, but then when it went to the legislature right around COVID, 2020 spring, uh, we lost the uh, support from some state's attorney's offices and, and that just sort of fell uh, to the wayside. But there was there was support across the boards initially in sentencing commission, including AGO, ODG, state's attorneys, the judiciary, DOC, um, probably others that I'm missing. In any event, the concept is this. Right now we have um, just a 90 day time limit very strict for filing a request outside of that 90 day period post dating sentencing or the finality of the sentence being upheld by the Supreme Court post that 90 day clock passing someone is out of luck to asking the court for review so there was a proposal to allow some flexibility in that taking away the time limit allowing for a second look so long as and uh, the materials that were passed around in June, Eitan passed around, the proposed language was something akin to getting, making sure we had, based on the stipulated agreement of all the parties involved, the prosecutors, uh, the defendant, um, and with the acceptance of the judiciary, I think was the rule, uh, that sentence reconsideration could occur and take place. And, um, but that's the proposal that fell through. So we still currently have on the books uh, the old law, which is the 90 day time limit. Uh, pretty harsh uh, consequence on that. So question has been posed, is it worth revisiting? Uh, Sentencing Commission has considered revisiting it and hasn't moved forward on it yet. RDAP certainly could consider and weigh in on that question. So there is that. There's also on the books current uh, midpoint review for pro probation uh, imposed in both adult and uh, juvenile delinquency uh, dispositions. And that provides an opportunity, an automatic look at once you reach the halfway point of probation to determine um, whether or not that uh, that probation should continue. Some of the limitations, that automatic look, it's not automatic. Uh, 
Well, for for in the instance of juvenile delinquencies, so there was lots of room there to sort of revisit the finesse. So let me just so that's it really for a second look. I mean, people have talked about alternative proceedings in different courts, getting out of the criminal court system to revisit a civil court. You take you know other kinds of proceedings, post conviction relief. We're not concerned with that. We're concerned with specifically allowing. A, a judge to revisit the sentence imposed in just that narrow topic. And, and working from that, we looked at what other states and um, Congress had, have done on this front. And we have lots and lots of models to work from. And so instead of, we weren't at the point of pulling and reviewing the language of these statutes, we discussed sort of the general concepts that these uh, various laws focused on. Um, and really what the goal was, was that it allowed fundamentally a court to reevaluate the sentence uh, that was previously imposed after certain events take, take place, uh, passage of time, certain amount of time has taken place and to determine whether the sentence or uh, disposition in the juvenile delinquency context is still appropriate. Another theme that develops around this is to develop you know, a meaningful opportunity for review uh, to make sure that um, you get input from from all sides that we try to address whether these recognizing various disparities going into sentencing decisions, including racial disparities, to try to inject some sort of objective criteria to to make sure that we can remove some of that discretion that enters in and has been problematic in the past. So developing objective criteria, criteria, deciding what times. Um, and another another theme that, that we see uh, across the country, states having passed this, is an automatic review. So it doesn't require an affirmative action on the part of the, of the juvenile uh, or adult who's in sentence. Um, okay. Yeah, I, and, can you and I can- Sentence again, Rebecca, what, what you sorry? just said. Can you say that last sentence that you just said? Sure. Another theme that we see develop is building in a mechanism for automatic review of the sentence so that it doesn't turn on whether an adult sitting in, in a jail or a child sitting, you know, in, in, a, in, you know, in the custody of DCF or, or whatnot or being in a secure facility. It doesn't turn on their their affirmative applications requesting a second look. It just happens after a certain um, measures passed time um, and and else and elsewhere. Again, going a little bit more detailed, and this is the last place, and I'll stop. Uh, the various legislations have looked at well, which which sentences should should qualify for second look. And so some jurisdictions have focused on, well, let's look at the ones who are incarcerated and sentenced to the longest sentences uh, to make sure that we don't lose sight of whether or not the original reasons for um, imposing them uh, have changed, right? To make sure that, that the purposes of sentencing, recognizing, you know, changing norms, uh, following over time can be revisited, lots of different reasons. The costs born, it's a recognition of the, co the severe costs suffered with, with lengthy sentences, costs in terms of financial, costs in terms of a societal loss for that person, costs in terms of adequate rehabilitation, family, friends, all, all sorts of um, costs involved there, uh, whether or not more studies have shown that it actually serves the original purpose intended. Does serving a longer sentence actually deter? Does it actually rehabilitate? Is it actually punitive? Is that what we want as a priority? So focusing on length of sentence, another type type and nature of the offense involved underlying the offense. So some have focused on the most serious uh, felonies, all right? Again, linking up to uh, types of offenses. Some have focused on the age of the person at the time that the crime occurred, getting at the youth um, who are incarcerated and sitting in adult prisons, uh, recognizing as, 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 as we get 
all the studies have been recognized for a while now, but what has not caught up is, is the judicial system recognizing it, right? The scientific studies on the adolescent brain and, and whether or not actions by um, children or youth under the age of 26 or 26 should receive uh, the same culpability as someone who's older, right? Uh, studies have shown that, that the science, the brain uh, has a different, um, shows something different in terms of culpability, right? So it's assessing that base, so that they're, so they're getting at that, focusing on youth. Um, other things that are, are considered, whether or not through this second look process, is the person entitled to a right to counsel? Is the person entitled to a review process? so that uh, you get a further built-in check on the situation. Another question has been, well, what do you do uh, with the cost savings? If second look, if a judge grants the request and lessens the term of incarceration, uh, some legislation has, has been targeted towards, well, what do we do with those savings? Reinvest them in specific places. Um, so that's, that's, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, areas that we're looking at. Any questions? Jennifer, I'll ask hi. one. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. Um, I sent, I'm with you on the sentence, uh, Sentencing Commission, so I guess I'm a little bit confused because I know that this is a part of what the Sentencing Senate Commission has been looking at, so I feel like this is a discussion that should have been happening and I know I signed on for the subcommittee, but that hasn't met. And it feels like a lot of information that in no way, shape or form have victims been a voice in. So this feels really concerning to me to be now having this discussion right here. Um, and we just did earn time. We've done, um, you know, early discharge from probation. I just am confused as to why we're having this discussion here when as the vice chair of the Senate Commission, I thought we would be having that more there. So um, I appreciate what you've been doing um, in terms of research, but I just feel like this should have been a piece that was vetted there. So I'm curious about the overlap. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for, for raising that. And I forgot to mention it here this evening, but throughout this process, when this subcommittee has been meeting, um, when before the subcommittee met for RDAP, I shared that I was also vice chair and that we've been working on this issue in the sentencing commission as well. Uh, and I also shared that we were at the beginning of that. Um, and you're part of that subcommittee as well, Jennifer, and we haven't had, uh, maybe we've met two or three times total. And then the legislature, the se session set in, right? The timing of this happened to be that we started discussing, looking up from our data, project um, and coming back to revisiting areas that might be of interest for RDAP. And um, RDAP has visited Sentencing Commission at least once. Um, there's been significant overlap of interest areas. And I think what you're seeing here is, um, is one of those areas of overlap. I think that one of the discussions we had as a subcommittee, and I think I mentioned it last month or a month before was specifically knowing this, knowing that there was an effort, parallel effort in sentencing commission, whether or not it made sense for IRDAP to go forward separately or to join forces or to defer to the work of sentencing commission. And others here should chime in, but my understanding was where we landed on this was that there are definitely different um, people involved here, here specifically, we have we have uh, active community members who are panel members here who are not on sentencing commission. We have the specific focus on addressing racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile delinquency system. Sentencing commission, of course, the mandate is different, not focused on racial disparities, not inclusive of the juvenile delinquency systems. So our discussion was, it is great that there is this overlap. It's great that we have crossover of subcommittee members, Evan and Aaron included on both of these subcommittees. And we thought that at this preliminary stage, it made sense to keep them separate, but to not, you know, we have some synergy growing 
inherently and naturally, given some of the, the crossover. Uh, as to your concern about feeling left out of this process, I, I think it's great, great you're here. I welcome you to be um, part of the the, um, the subcommittee. We can send we can send you s some notices and, and when that gets going. Um, and hopefully on the sentencing commission side, we'll get that going as well. Uh, but I know that this was the specific interest of getting this part and it came up because we've been talking a lot about reform ideas in this panel, but focused on the pre-conviction side of it for our VAP. And we wanted to address and think about reform ideas getting to people who are already incarcerated, who have already been held uh, with juvenile dispositions. And this was an area that popped up. I think Aaron Jacobson was the one who recommended it. Sure, and I appreciate that. I just think that there are ripple effects that, you know, people who've been harmed by crime also need to have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. Evan? Thanks, Eitan, and, and thanks, uh, Rebecca, for the summary of our subcommittee meeting on, what was it? I think it was like June 9th or something like that. Um, uh, but, you know, I do share some of Jen's concerns, though, especially around victims. And I think that that was a concern that I tried to flag on June 9th. You know, it's it, it's unfortunately very easy for victims to get lost in a lot of these criminal justice reform conversations. But, you know, they weren't mentioned much during our June 9th subcommittee meeting. They weren't mentioned at all in the handout from the June 9th committee meeting that was then referenced or, or circulated to this group. Um, and, you know, they weren't referenced in the summary of the June 9th meeting. And I think that we really need to understand not only how sentences affect defendants, because they certainly do, but they also affect uh, victims to a very great degree. And that includes uh, victims from across every demographic. Um, and I think that we need to be keeping victims in mind as well when we're talking about disparities based on any immutable characteristic. Um, and I, I also, it, it was not my recollection that we ag agreed to move separately on this issue as RDAP. I, I think that there's value at a minimum in the two committees working together, even if ultimately the Sentencing Commission and RDAP might make different recommendations about what course the legislature should take in terms of reforms. I think there is a sufficient overlap in the composition of the two groups that some efficiencies could be um, obtained and some perspectives could be gained by having the, the two subcommittees work in tandem with one another. Um, so I think that that could be beneficial I also think that as RDAP moves forward in this conversation, we really need to keep in mind how it might be connected to this group's mission, right? I mean, our group's enabling legislation, well, I mean, it, does, it doesn't It does specifically identify things like second look legislation, and I, but if we're going to move forward with a proposal like that, I think we need to be prepared to identify for ourselves, the public and the legislature and victims um, how, you know, where are the, any disparities in sentencing? What are the causes of those disparities? And would something like second look legislation actually address those disparities? Because we want to make sure that if we move forward with a second look scheme, um, you know, we don't want to implement it in a way that could exacerbate or create new disparities, which is certainly possible. We have a lot of a you know, objectively neutral laws that I think we found out have been implemented, um, not necessarily evenly all the time. And, and I think we need to be cautious um, with any new regime that we put forward. So I, I just wanted to make sure that the rest of the RDAP understood that, um, you know, the committee is, is looking at this topic, but we haven't necessarily reached a consensus on some of these big points. And I just wanted to make sure that folks were, were, were clear that the department had some concerns. Hopefully we'll get those ironed out um, through additional conversation. I had been thinking along what 
what Rebecca had asked us to think about what parts of this are particularly um, plangent in a way for those of us who are on the RDAP. And I think what I wanted to say sort of addresses what you, Jennifer, and Evan have just mentioned about victims. I'm not sure that what I have to say actually says any, it doesn't, it doesn't go to where sentencing commission seems to be. Um, what I've been thinking of, and partly because in the trainings that um, Barb Kessler and I do for um, the police academy, we show the film 13th quite often. And if you watch that film as much as we have, which is to say about a thousand times at this point, um, one of the things that becomes very clear is the way in which marijuana legislation, um, certainly through the 80s, was used, um, and frankly, by a Democratic president in the 90s to get people off the street and put them away with that wonderful three strikes idea and we're still cleaning up from that. I mean, I just remember signing a petition the other day online about someone else who'd been put away for life because they had a pot conviction. Um, I don't know, you all are lawyers, or a lot of you are lawyers, I'm not. But I don't know what in Vermont we may have that would be an analog to that. But if there is something that would be an analog to that, and it has been proven beyond reason that there is enormous racial disparity in the way that sentencing around those three strikes laws um, came to be, there was enormous racial disparity there. And I personally was interested um, in looking at the ways in which those sorts of mechanisms may be functioning within the state. Evan. Uh, thanks, Eitan. I think I think that's a really it's a really good question. Um, and, and I think it actually gets to one of the points that Rebecca flagged in that in that June 9th handout, which is an important one. You know, what offenses are going to be eligible, right? Um, at what point in someone's sentence are we going to start reviewing this kind of thing? For example, do we have the kind of problem in Vermont like the one that you just identified? And, and I, I don't know the answers to all of those questions. Um, you know, I, I think the committee is probably going to delve into some of that. But, but one thing that I did do back in September of 20, 2021 uh, as part of the the sentencing commission commission's work on this was that I asked uh, DOC if they could sort of give me a list of those individuals who uh, will end up serving uh, 15 years or more in in in, in prison um, or you know effectively incarcerated because they're on furlough but being supervised in the community and the idea was that 10 years and 15 years um tended to be a common number uh but my understanding anyway i could be wrong about that a common number for when someone might get the benefit of a second look review and the the spreadsheet that i got there was actually a, a far more people than i thought um you know several several hundred people um, I think around 318, but many of the offenses that is causing that length of supervision are things like uh, homicides, murders, manslaughters, aggravated assaults, uh, you know, sexual assaults, aggravated sexual assaults. And so I think that, um, you know, one thing that we need to look at is, is those two points that you raised, you know, for what offenses would people be eligible and who who actually is getting dinged with these really long sentences? Uh, and and fortunately, we, we can get some of that data in order to make uh, a better informed decision about what recommendation to make. OK. Thank you. Sheila. Thank you, Aton. I just want to acknowledge, I don't know if it's just me, but um, we're getting into really heady conversation. 
and even though it seems maybe kind of simplistic, it's um, it's a lot and it's it's really busy. I'm appreciative of it, but I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of deep conversation going on in the space. So Rebecca, thank you for saying what um, you said and giving us a report out. I'm, I, I think I have multiple sort of comments or questions or things, but I'm gonna focus on three things and try to be clear. So one of my questions is around why. I'm kind of curious. So when you mentioned um, uh, um, these, um, the 90 day time limit, um, and I, I apologize if I didn't hear it, but I'm wondering with these various different um, laws that we are looking at, I'm wondering what's the why behind it of why they were created. So, and just, yeah, I'm just curious. Why, why is it, and it's not for you to answer right now. I'm just wondering to the group. I just want to pose that question of why were these laws created? Like we're talking about laws and a lot of laws were created under white supremacy and under, uh, on, on, and due to racism, a lot of laws. And so kind of curious of what was the thought or feeling in Vermont of why these even stipulations laws even came into creation? Because that would be interesting for me to know and moving forward of why we wouldn't want these laws and would help gain us maybe information on what we're really talking about, which is racial disparities. Um, the other kind of question I have is, um, which I've been really curious about using um, sort of a Tom, what you said around the marijuana laws, I'm very curious of what happens when laws do change. So somebody's in jail right now in Vermont for marijuana. We've done this. What I actually don't know. I'm extremely ignorant to what are their rights now? Are they allowed to go back? It does that change for them or are they just SOL because they got imprisoned and during that time and it was the law at that time. And so, sorry, you know, I actually don't know the answer to those questions on any of the laws. And so I'm really curious of what does happen or is it like, that's what we're doing right now. We're trying to figure out what does really happen and we're making it up as we go along. And meanwhile, people are continuing to be harmed. Um, and then my final question, really more statement is, I'm listening to everybody talk and we are here because we are addressing racial disparities in the criminal adult and juvenile systems. And so I'm wondering, does it matter what the crime is? And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's adding up to me because the foundation of what we're looking at is racial disparities and racial disparities go across any crime that we must be talking about. I cannot imagine that there isn't necessarily racial disparities. Now, I understand we've had some reports from, I think it was Stephanie and some other people who are like, oh, the Coke and crack, but that's all due to racism too, of what that disparity is. So we can say and have the argument that the Coke was all the white people, so there isn't disparity there, so we're not looking at that. But that was created um, to balance out this crack um, convictions over here. So I'm very curious of why does it matter what the crime is if we are in agreement that white supremacy lives in these systems, um, racial discrimination is happening, we understand that racial disparities go across the board. That is the common denominator we should be looking at and not piecemealing of which crime should be looked at because we can know we can just open up Netflix like we were talking about the 13th and know that there are people who have been prosecuted for murders who didn't murder people and people who have been for a lower crime who have been busted for weed that shouldn't be in jail now. So does the crime really matter when taking a second look is my question. Just general for the whole group. Hey, Tom, can I respond or is there someone else? Please, on? yeah, no, go for it. I was just Sheila, thinking. Sheila, thank you for like, for those three points and they're each one also really big. So let me recognize that as well, like big and and keeping it on, on the big issues. And I think, let me start with the first one as a response. When I was looking for, quickly to get a summary sense of what current legislation, what current models for second look legislation are out there. That's what I shared with you in terms of focusing on crime. I am with you and what I want to share, and I forgot to mention this, this summary, none seem to have as a primary focus, secondary focus, even mention of, of second look being developed and enacted to address racial disparities. And so what we are not seeing is, is, is exactly what your point is. It doesn't matter about uh, the crime when we have 
um, a structure, right? This racial, this racist structure in place, and and how to keep that the focus on, right? So there's that. Then I have um, the focus too on types of crimes have been uh, that's been passed are on some of the most serious offenses. But your question brought up things that we know from 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 a lot of different sources now about the misdemeanor and misdemeanor system and how much they capture so many people and bring them in and keep them into the system. And I think the, perhaps when we go forward, making sure we're centering the, the second look legislation, making sure it's addressing racial disparities generally, I think there is a role to approach it from a, uh, an offense-based approach, but always with a focus on perhaps why are we focusing on that? Right. And and, you know, I'm just thinking about how CSG we, you know, Evan, you talked about not sure we should be focusing on this because we maybe I, I heard in your suggestion or comment that we need more data. I, and if I if I heard that wrong, um, then so be it. But like, this is the moment where I just want to remind us all we do have some useful data on this point from CSG. Right. And, and others. And we've had this in the compilation reports. And again, Sheila's point on the type of offense we know that certain drug offenses. Uh, that certain uh, that more black um, people in Vermont are likely to be charged with certain types of felony drug offenses. So that to me, maybe a way we can use certain offenses um, to target what your bigger point is, is making sure this addresses racial disparities. Second point, marijuana. Um, I, I agree with, oh, retroactivity question. What happens with new changes in the law that are favorable? What happens to the old, you know, I'm nodding my head and I also don't know. We lit, we, this is a big issue for us um, um, in, in the litigation and we can absolutely make recommendations for future legislation, current amendments to current legislation to make sure that if we want uh, reform measures to have retroactive effect, then we should make, we should think about that, right? And then as to your first one, um, also a really important point, I don't have the answer. Why, how did those 90 day or other time limits that are such a huge wall with, with significant consequences, where do they come from? Which row them? I don't know uh, the answer to that. I, I think your point is well taken that we should be understanding how we got to the place to then better understand what's the best way to correct it. Right. Um. I'm just just to add in here, not to call on you, but Evan knows the answer to that. <laughs> um, Jennifer Holman. I refer to Evan first because I was going to put him on the spot and he didn't know uh, that I was going to do that, but I do want to weigh in um, briefly. I, I'm on <laughs> the spot. What? <laughs> I, you, I, well, I, you had mentioned last month, I remember very particularly, you talked about the 90 day, um, that limit and why oh it was, uh-oh, you don't remember. Well, I definitely don't remember what I said last meeting, but I can say that in, I, I can, I have two thoughts to offer. Um, the first of which is in, in general, my understanding is that the limitation that, that there is a time limitation for seeking a sentence reconsideration because the law in general uh, places some value on the issue of finality, finality for the court so that its jurisdiction is not never ending over any particular matter, finality for a defendant to a certain degree, even though a, some, some defendants, I guess, may wish that things weren't final, finality for the state, finality for the community, and most importantly, finality for the victims. In terms of why that deadline is 90 days, my understanding is that Vermont law took that 90-day deadline from federal law. I don't know, though, why 90 days was selected in federal law. In other words, as opposed to 100 days or 120 or 30 days, right? So I don't know why that specific time period was taken, but my understanding is that same 90 day time frame appears in federal law. That's what you said last month. I just didn't want to oh. take it away from you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I was like, that wasn't my point. It was Evan's point. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Now you're Jennifer, and then Jeff, and then sure, Jeff. Sure, I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to say, as in um, from our standpoint, we've never um, opposed any of the uh, movements towards expungement and sealing with respect to drug crimes. Um, that's not ever a piece that we've ever taken a position on, and we can completely support and see where that's coming from. Um, for from our perspective, it's more the person, the crimes of personal violence that um, absolutely we would want victims to be heard when it comes to crimes of sexual assault, domestic violence, homicide, aggravated assault. Those are pieces where victims' voices should be heard. And right now, you know, we're already hearing that victims' voices have, they agreed to a sentence, but that's already going to be changed because you're getting set potentially seven days off a sentence each month. So as far as whether it's automatic or what that looks like um, for those crimes, we, from my standpoint, there has to be a voice for victims in that process. And so I'm looking forward to working with the groups on the Senate Commission in here just to make sure that there is that process. And again, we are also concerned um, about victims who are, you know, not a part of the conversation, who are often dismissed because of where they sit, because of who they are, who aren't taken seriously. And those are pieces that we also want to elevate. So for for that perspective, and again, Sheila, um, I've watched you so much on YouTube. I respect you so much. And just um, letting you know that with those particular crimes, that's a piece that we really do want to be heard. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Jeff? Well, I'd like to walk this back just a touch. When someone, for whatever reason, uh, is the victim of racial disparities, they are a victim of something which is illegal, very seriously. And therefore, I think we have every right to make every discussion when learning that. And I reject the fact that that can be challenged. Just look at the disparities in the treatment of some police departments in this state, those people are victims. And that is against the law. And they are sentenced and punished inappropriately. That's all I want to say. I want to walk it back a bit. Why are we here? What's the name of this crew? And what are we thinking about? Right. Thanks, Jeff. Judge Zone. So I've been needs a job as a law school professor. Uh, very well done. <laughs> I do agree with him on the uh, on the part about the uh, 90 days. It basically follows federal law, and I do not know where the 90 came from as far as that number. Many jurisdictions. I did want to touch base, though, on the, the one thing that Rebecca mentioned, and we've kind of danced around, and that is this uh, 90 days and the sentence reconsideration. The Sentencing Commission advanced a provision that would have changed 90 days uh, to allow a sentence reconsideration at any time upon agreement of the prosecutor who had the case, the defendant, and the judge would have to accept it. And that would necessarily include victim input. And that did not go forward. And I would again note that that's an important provision when you're looking at racial disparities, I think, because... If you have any situations where everyone agrees, if you have the prosecutor say, I believe my predecessor may have been influenced by racial uh, you know, bias here, I want to change that. If it's outside the 90 days, it can't be done. I think the law should have something in there to have that to be able to occur. And that's why the sentencing commission is supposed to go forward on that. And so I recognize there's a second look and some other aspects which I would uh, I would acknowledge are much more controversial, if you will. But I would hope this one isn't the 90 days in time upon agreement because everyone gets to see at the table. The prosecutor has to agree. The defendant has to agree. The victim has an absolute opportunity to be heard. And the judge has to approve it. And so if, if this group were to weigh in on that, I would be hopeful that we could try to push that this next legislative session. Right. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else?
Sheila. Um, I think I heard, it was a little bit hard to hear you, um, but I, I think I heard what was being said. And I'm just, what I think I'm, be, what I think I heard is that there is some provisions in place to allow those who were involved in that case per se, to have an impact on whether the 90 days, whether you can go beyond the 90 days or not. Um, and so I was just a little disconnected from that comment because even though I know that's true, I'm talking about that in Vermont, knowing that most leadership is white. Once again, readdressing what I just said in my last comments about how white supremacy is in everything. And if everyone gets to agree, but isn't that kind of like the point, like the person goes to the court and then the judge is like, the judge agrees with the lawyer or the prosecutor, isn't it the same thing? going over again and maybe it's giving another opportunity for them to have a different thought, a different feeling, a different understanding of the situation. But um, just because there's given the opportunity doesn't mean it's effective. Like we can talk about uh, proclamation, max, uh, ma excuse me, we can talk about all sorts of things that we're given opportunity to, but don't necessarily are effective or happen. So I'm a little, I'm disconnected from the comments here. And maybe I'd like somebody can lean into me and let me help me understand if I'm off, but I'm feeling like this is the same difference of the same body. It's the, you're, if I heard you correctly, the same people who prosecuted that person has to now agree a year later that they didn't want to prosecute that. And yes, maybe that does happen, but I would like to know how often has that happened in Vermont and how often does it and is my point um, do people understand my point of how effective that might be or not be? I'm, 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 I'm a little bit angry and confused right now. Evan. Thanks, Aton. Uh, Sheila, I, I don't think you're disconnected at, at all, uh, at least in, in my opinion. And it was, it was something that I was trying to flag um, earlier. Uh, and maybe I didn't do so well, but so so right now, um, the law does not allow the parties to stipulate that a sentence can be reconsidered after 90 days. One idea that came out of the Sentencing Commission was to create that ability in the law. Um, I wasn't uh, serving on the Sentencing Commission when that conversation was happening, so I. I I don't have as much knowledge about why that proposal ultimately fell apart as others in this group, but um, but but going directly to your comment, it, it's what I was trying to say, which is we could create that in the law, but what do you know? How what are our guarantees that that's that's actually going to address any racial disparities? In other words, we might allow that to happen, and then five years from now, are we going to discover? Oh boy, it, it turns out that you know. Uh, prosecutors are only stipulating when the defendants are white or, uh, you know, um, defense attorneys are only filing these motions for sentence reconsideration when the defendants are white. And nobody, they might not be doing so consciously, but we, we now know that conscious bias isn't the only bias that exists. And so that was my point, which is, you know, we, we, we know there's biases and we have an idea for criminal justice reform, but we really need to make sure that we connect the dots between the two and make sure that the reforms actually address the disparities and don't exacerbate them or create new ones. I think that that should be, that should be the goal when we come up with these proposals. Okay. Sheila, and then I'd like to move us along to our next topic. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to bring up, I think a couple of years back, and I excuse because I don't think he's in the room, but I believe Judge um, Garrison had mentioned a few years back some concern on some of these, some type of these laws because of who was liable and what and what would happen. So let's say these parties agree. So first of all, I wanna say, I think this is a option. I'm not shutting down this option. I'm just saying that then where's the accountability? I don't know, I feel like it might be a false solution um, because my understanding is some comments I believe a couple of years ago that Judge Garrison made was he was concerned, if I'm correct, about what position this would put those attorneys, judges, or whomever in those power decision-making positions. What would it, that put them in in terms of being liable? 
Um, and do those people have immunity or where's then the accountability? So you messed up and said that there was racial disparities and I was a piece of that, which Jeff right here pointed out, which is against the law. And yet we're gonna be like, yeah, we messed up, but we just gonna make it good from here on out. And, and where's, where's the accountability? So I distinctly remember Judge Garrison being very concerned about this. And I'm, I'm sure there are people in the space who are very concerned about it. I'm concerned about it on the other end of immunity being used and there being a lack of accountability and this being a false solution to, to look like there's accountability when really there isn't. And so, um, though I like some elements, I, 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 again, I see through, I see through, I see through the weeds. Okay. We thank you. We're going to need to, I want to let this one go for right now, because obviously we have a lot, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about on this one and it's going to be huge. Um, Rebecca, I think the next move is probably to talk about when the subcommittee can meet again. So Sorry, I mean, we don't need an answer now. You know, I'm just saying, I think that that's, I think we need to go there so that we have something big and solid to bring back to the panel as a whole, and then make that conversation a bit more efficient if we can. And then mess it up again and go off and do it again. Um, but I, that would be my suggestion. So were I to leave this for the moment, because we're not going to solve it in the next hour? Good, OK. I want to move on to the Juvenile Justice Subcommittee, and which will include our two um, guests for the evening. Um, I'm not, Tyler, do you want, I mean, Elizabeth presented this last time. You're here now. I don't know how you guys want to separate the labor here, but have at it. Yeah, I, I don't, so our subcommittee has not met since the last meeting <laughs> on this topic. Um, so I have fairly little to report. I did want to say that I'm really appreciative for the conversation we just had. It was one that, you know, I, I didn't have as much to weigh in on, but I'm very grateful for the depth of conversation that just occurred. Um, with regard to the juvenile justice one, we presented what it was we were able to, you know, compile and put together. I can see there was robust, from the minutes, I can see there was robust conversation. Apologies to the group that I wasn't there for it. Um, and I would like to at some point have uh, maybe hear about from group members, um, you know, what actionable next steps kind of came out of that conversation, what points of interest. I do notice they reflect in the notes, a couple, you know, conversations to follow on what happened with Woodside, so on and so forth. Um, but that would be useful to me uh, as we kind of pick this back up and, you know, that way our group can gather together. Um, but, and after that, I think I would turn it over to Elizabeth, who is kind of active in this process to see if she has any thoughts of follow up before, you know, we ask um, our guests to contribute to that side of the equation. So Elizabeth, did you have anything you wanted to pick up? Yeah, thanks Tyler. So there was, there were three specific asks from us for this meeting uh, that I wanna make sure that we're following up um, and, and providing to all of you. The first one um, was more detail on some of the information that the crime research group uh, discovered in their recidivism report to um, our system improvement committee, as we call them, uh, which is a state uh, subcommittee of our state advisory group. Um, and Robin, I, I know Robin, you're here. So um, I'm happy that you're here because I know you can answer more, a lot more questions on that than, than I potentially could. Uh, then there was um, a desire to learn more about just the JGRA in general. I know Sheila in particular, you had asked for an overview of what DCF is required to do in general, what that law is, um, and uh, what we're kind of on the hook for, I guess what you said. So I'm ready to, to go over that. And there was also a desire to go over the ERD plan, which has that data that we submit to OJJDP. So those are the three things that I think that we can talk about under our section right now. Um, and I'm actually wondering, Sheila, not to put you on the spot, but it might make most sense for you to go over 
um, more in more detail that information that you discovered for 18 and 19 year olds in your recidivism report since we did talk about it um, at the last meeting and then we can move on to the more general data that we haven't talked about yet. Does that, does that work for you, Robin? Oh, yes, me, yes. It does. Does that work for the group? Oh. Sure. Okay. So, hi. It's been a while since I've been before this group. Um, yes, so uh, we did a report um, at the request of uh, DCF and their systems improvement group on giving a baseline recidivism um, for 18 and 19 year olds um, that were processed in the adult system. And uh, the idea behind the request was that this was to give them to see when we um, move those kids down into uh, the juvenile system, if they have better results, right, as far as measuring recidivism. Recidivism is the measure that we were asked to measure, so that's what we measured. Um, there are other things that people can measure, but this is what we can do with administrative records. And I think the point that you all were interested in was a footnote of mine um, on the Big 12. So under the legislation, um, I'm going to use the term youth. I don't know what 18 and 19, what, what the appropriate term is. For my 18-year-old self is screaming at being called a youth, but um, I'm going to use youth. Um, damn it, I was an adult. Um, <clears throat> children with unformed brains, I'm not sure. But anyway, the 18 and 19-year-olds, um, you know, what um, the so the, if you are charged with what is called a Big 12 crime, you are not eligible for um, going down to uh, juvenile court. And um, so when I was looking at that and I was removing those, those, those youth kids from the, system, from the study, I just did a quick race analysis and found that this was going to disproportionately affect um, black youth um, and that they weren't going to be able to get the get the benefit of going to juvenile um, court. And the benefit is that you're not going to get a criminal record, right? I mean, so there's a huge benefit in addition to um, the more care-focused um, approach as opposed to a punitive approach in the, in the adult system. So this is a policy, that, like Evan was talking about earlier, where really good intentions, it's, but it's going to contribute to our racial disparity. So I was pointing that out in, in that footnote, that this is something that wasn't addressed um, in the legislation and is going to have this disparate impact and will compound, right, because those kids that are going to go through um, the adult system are now going to get that criminal history, and that's going to keep, you know, um, compounding next time they go forward, like, look, they've already been through the system. So um, those that aren't aware, the Big 12 crimes, and I've been doing this for 17 years, and I don't know where this list came from. I know it's part of what we call listed offenses, which is statutory, but does anyone actually know, like, who came up with this 12? Everyone is shaking their heads, Robin. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's just been around <laughs> as long as I have. Um, and if Judge Zoni doesn't know and some of the others that have been around, uh, then, yeah. So um, the Big 12, and I had it up, um, but basically it's your murders, your manslaughters, um, sexual assaults, aggravated assault, um, burglary uh, in an occupied dwelling, uh, mayhem, uh, unlawful restraint, depending on how, how you, you actually list them out, depends on actually how many crimes there are. I think what was interesting about this, though, is that one crime in particular is one is affecting, well, two crimes are affecting uh, the black youth in this cohort. It's a very small number. I just want to say that. It is a very small number of people, but these people are going to be affected. And the two crimes that were kind of coming up um, were probably the most controversial on that list, which is the burglary of an occupied dwelling and the aggravated assault. Um, so then, anticipating a question or two, I then went and looked at the court data. I'm like, how many times are people charged, are, are, are these, this age group charged with, um, you know, aggravated assault and it comes down to something else, right? Because if you're automatically excluded, 
because of the charge, but you plead down to something else, where does that leave you in this juvenile, you know, in this expansion of juvenile court? It still kind of leaves you in adult court, as far as I understand. So, um, overall, uh, you know, if you are found guilty, but that's also a big if, if you are found guilty of the, of the charge that excluded you from ju juvenile court, um, you were found guilty of that charge. So, it's not a lot of being charged with aggravated assault and being dropped down to um, a simple assault. However, this is just back of the napkin kind of stuff. Um, it does not include, I can, I just didn't have time to do it. Um, and we have a whole study that's going to look at this in a year or two. Uh, it doesn't look at the whole process of stacking of charges. Right, um, so you charge the aggravated assault and then you charge something else, um, I don't know, disorderly conduct, and really it's a disorderly conduct, but somebody is upping the charges along the way to, to try to get a better, you know, uh, to scare somebody or something. Um, so if the one-to-one the -one ratio of what you're charged with and what you're convicted of if you are convicted is pretty much, there's not a lot of movement. Not a lot of people are convicted, um, and um, it does not include the whole mess of charges that you can get when you, um, yeah, so this is just back of the napkin, the, the stuff um, for future study. So I thought that was, you know, if I had to say one thing to this panel, I would say the um, burglar, burglary of an occupied dwelling, which I know in the past, and like I'm talking to the Douglas administration, people were talking about really looking into that because it is an occupied dwelling if it's a second home and no one's been there for six months. It's an occupied dwelling if somebody breaks in while, you know, during the day and no one's there. And I don't know if it's an occupied dwelling if it's my shed in the backyard. Um, but what do you, you know, that was, that was, there was some discussion and I think the Sentencing Commission does have a subcommittee on listed offenses of which these 12 are, um, to look at those listed offenses because they keep, just kind of keep on growing. Um, so I'll just stop there since I can't see any of you um, and see what kind of questions you may have or comments or other quick analysis that I can do for you on the fly. I'm looking, Robin, but there are no hands yet. So, oh, no, Rebecca. So just quick, uh, hi Robin, it's Rebecca. Hi. I just, I just, I think uh, Elizabeth, did you just forward us that report that you're talking about? So we haven't. I certainly haven't had. A, I've never. I haven't seen. I haven't had a chance to read this report. <laughs> um, I appreciate you being here and sharing some of the highlights. Well, so the report is just the for, is the so the report is really about juvenile about those 18 and 19 year olds and recidivating. Um, it's the footnote that has to deal with racial disparities. So in the footnote, I'm saying this policy is going to lead to racial disparities later on. So I'm trying to try to explain the footnote. Okay. Anyone else? That helped Robin, thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I sign off then if nobody that, has anything else. Right. I, does anyone? Yeah, let's not keep poor Robin here if we. <laughs> does anyone have another question for her? No. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs> Elizabeth, do we want um, Mr. Paul to go then? Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Do we want Mr. Paul to speak now, our other guest? I, uh, absolutely, or I can feel free to go into the overview of the JJRA um, and then some more details on the BRD plan, whatever seems appropriate. What works best for you guys? I think while we have Marshall here, I think it'd be great to hear what he has to say. I know we'll be able to, we'll be here next, next month as well, if we run out of time. Right. Okay, great. 
Great. Then I will go. I will go, and I will try to be fairly brief. Um, so, for people who don't know me, um, I'm Marshall Paul. I'm the Chief Juvenile Defender uh, for the state of Vermont, and I've been working in juvenile defense since hmm, 2010, anyway. Um, and so, it's really been a big focus of my career. And generally, when I show up in a meeting like this, I'm here to tell everybody that. Juvenile law and juvenile justice is way more important than people are giving it credit for, and that that's where people really need to focus their energy. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of that today, um, but in particular, I want to focus on a couple of issues that I think probably Elizabeth and Tyler are going to talk about in more detail, and that's just areas in the in our juvenile justice system where I think racial disparities are. You know, fundamentally the most problematic and of course it's problematic to have racial disparities anywhere in the system. But one thing I think happens when we talk about racial disparities in the juvenile system is the focus tends to go where the numbers are the greatest. You know, when we have areas where there is, you know, the greatest number of kids who are facing disparate treatment because of their race, that's of course what everybody pays attention to because of the numbers. But I'm hoping to sort of focus people's attention on that same number that um, that Robin was just talking about, and that's focusing on those kids who are being charged as adults. And that's actually, you know, when when Tyler and Elizabeth talk through their, uh, you know, the racial the racial disparity data that DCF has collected, I don't know if they'll talk about that issue exactly. They'll talk about a lot of issues that are going to seem a lot bigger because of the numbers of kids involved. It's actually in Vermont, a very small number of youth are charged as adults. However, I'm here to argue to RDAP that the disparity in that category is actually, even though it's one of the smallest numbers of kids, it's actually one of the most important disparities because that's where we're talking about the, the ways that that system has the greatest impact. I mean, the differences, as Robin sort of alluded to, the differences between the juvenile system and the adult system are really significant. And it's not just the question of, do you come out of it with a record? It's, do you come out of it with a record? It's how long are you under supervision? It's what are the effects of that supervision? What happens, um, you know, how are you supervised? What happens in the event of a violation or an alleged violation or even a revocation? Um, it has to do with what types of supervision do you get? What kinds of probation conditions are you put under? Um, and what kinds of expectations are there? I mean, the differences are tremendous. And really, it's been proven up and down that um, the juvenile system, and especially the juvenile probation system, hands down is better for youth than the adult system. That when youth are put in the adult system, they are more likely to come out of that system more likely to commit further offenses in the future than when they went into that system. It actually makes kids more likely to recidivate um, and less likely to desist from offending behavior. And the juvenile system actually has incredibly a completely different record. It had, the juvenile system in a lot of ways has figured out how to reach youth and how to reach adolescents and kids who are emerging out of adolescence into adulthood. Um, and so that's really what we're talking about is we're talking about the question of are you sunk into the deepest end of the adult system with the stiffest consequences and the harshest adult penalties that are going to make you in the future more likely to commit adult offenses or are you going to get the benefits of the juvenile system which are actually going to make you less likely to commit adult offenses in the future and that's why I think this is a really important number and it's a number that scares me and that is that in Vermont, you know, it's about, um, well, if you look at just Chittenden County, it's about 40% of kids, of youth um, who are charged as adults are black. And that's in a county, you know, in Burlington, it's about 5% of the, of the kids under 18 are black. I'm not actually sure what the Chittenden County population, uh, what the population of black people overall in Chittenden County is, but I know that for kids under 18, which is what I have the data for, even though 19 is our age of juvenile jurisdiction, 18 is the age that the census uses. So I know age 18, even though I wish I knew age 19, but it's about 5% of the under 18 population of Chittenden County that's black, but it's about 40% 
of the kids who are being charged as adults. And that's actually an improvement. Uh, you know, there was years ago, it was above 50%. Years ago, more than 50% of the kids who were, who were being charged as adults in Chittenden County were black, even though the population of kids was, I mean, we're talking like 5%. So it's really a wild disparity. And even though it's a small number of kids, I mean, we're probably talking about, you know, I don't know, I'm just speculating here, but I bet it's under 20 kids per year around the state. I bet it's 10 kids per year in Chittenden County. Even though it's a small number of kids, this has been a very persistent disparity. You know, this is not just an outlier. This isn't just one year where, you know, some persist, you know, particular event um, has caused this disparity. This is a disparity that's seen year over year. Um, and frankly, from, from my perspective, seeing the effect that the, 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 you know, the difference in the juvenile versus the adult system and to see so many kids being denied that, uh, you know, those benefits of that juvenile system because of their race um, really, to me, just magnifies that one statistic, the importance of it, um, really kind of above all the others. Just, you know, it's, it's almost like it's incumbent on us as we start to address these disparities to start where we're doing the most damage and even if it's not to the greatest number of kids, man, that is the most damage. Like when it comes to excluding kids from the juvenile system, that's where the damage is the greatest. So I guess I'm just sort of hoping to focus people's, hoping to focus the RDAP's attention on that statistic. And as far as, you know, what can be done to address it, I'm not coming with any sort of particular policy recommendation except to say that. A lot of what we focus on in the juvenile system is we focus on dispositional things. We focus on what happens to kids after they have been charged in the juvenile system and what and uh, you know adjudicated. And we are trying to decide what should the juvenile system do with that kid. What services should be provided? What conditions should they have to be should they have to abide by? Um, but what we don't focus on often is the entry point. And that's what I think is really important here. You know, this is when it's when it's about juvenile court versus adult court. It's all about making this making some changes at that entry point. Um, and so that's I'm just hoping to kind of steer RDAP's attention towards this statistic and kind of towards that point of entry into the adult system as a point where some changes need to be made, even though I'm unfortunately I don't have any brilliant solutions to just kind of announce uh, that could solve the problem. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Questions, comments, people. I have one if no one else has one. Go for it. So I, I hate to put you on the spot and and um because 40% to me is 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 like jaw dropping. Yeah. And when we talked about that last month. I mean 40% when you compare it to the demographics of 5%, 40% period. So how does how does Vermont stack in terms of the rest of the country, if you know, in terms of that degree? I mean, it's jaw dropping from just looking at it from Vermont numbers. Is this the norm of, of is the extent of racism? There, there is a dramatic racial disparity in every state. Vermont is not at the top, like our numbers are not so high that we rise to the top of anybody's list in terms of our racial disparity in the juvenile justice system. But uh, I mean, as you can see, 40% of which is, you know, 35% above what would be expected. That's dramatic. So a follow up question, because this has come up a lot with our data talk and you touched upon it a little bit. Numbers, you would you talked about how these numbers are small, 20, 10. Um, how can we trust that the small numbers reveal what what you know what we're hearing that this is a serious yeah, you don't have to trust just those numbers because we like this is some of this data is reported year over year and so we can look back um so i you know elizabeth can probably answer i know they haven't been reporting those adult transfers all the way back because like i have the the i don't know it didn't it used to be called erd it used to be called uh DMC number, the DMC numbers going back to like 2015 never included like all of these uh, adult transfer numbers. 
that's only been in the last few years, but it's been enough that we've been able to see that it is consistent year over year. And that's what I always look for is trends year over year, because I mean, I think in Vermont, we can get one year that skews. Like if you just look at a snapshot with our small numbers, you can get weird outlier numbers. So I just always look for the year over year. Right, I mean, as, as a layman, it seems like it's significant that you have that over across time. Yeah. Julio. Uh, just so I understand the, 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 the number you threw out, is that, a, is that the overall number or, or the, is there a different number if you control for the seriousness of the offense that's charged? That's the overall number, but um, there's not going to be there's not going to be youth charged as adults for anything that's not serious. It's not even possible to transfer a youth up for a misdemeanor. Uh, so youth can only be transferred up for a felony um, or they can start in the adult system and remain in the adult system for a big 12 offense. But there are like there are felonies that are assault felonies and there are homicides. I mean, is there any, you know, within within the uh, the data that 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 identifies like what the large number of uh, of, of cases are are uh, moved to to court because I I'm just not familiar with that those numbers and I don't know how detailed they get. I think you'd have to get some more granular numbers from the court. Okay. okay. Anyone else? I would just chime in. I that's it's a really thought provoking statistic, um, yeah. and I recognize we're talking about Chitten, Chittenden County specifically, um, but I think it you know probably the statistic looks a little differently when you look at the entirety of the state. But I think the the point of it remains, um, and so and I think Marshall's exactly right to be putting us at. Um, we're talking about a relatively small group of of uh, youths, emerging adults, whatever we want to call them. Um, but I would say the, the the crux of the challenge here with regard to DCF is for all that that um, DCF is able to serve youth. Um, the reason we're able to serve youth differently is because we have a different emphasis, the emphasis on family, the emphasis is, is on um, remaining in the community, community placements, utilizing the family support groups, and so on and so forth. That's how DCF is structured and built um, around kind of all sides of how we operate. And I think that that yields us a great deal of opportunity for inter successful intervention around criminogenic behaviors as well. Um, where we have challenges uh, lies with our ability to provide for the public safety in that context. And so when we're talking about the small group of youth with these um, Big 12 charges, often the conversation um, becomes attached to public safety. And so I would just further emphasize to, to the point that Marshall made um, that that also attracts all the attention to it. So we're talking about a small group of people, but we're talking about something that inflames and excites communities and systems around what the area of concern is here. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I wish you had a solution to come with that idea, Marshall, of focusing on entry point, but I think that is the good starting point is what, you know, that looking at what the entry point uh, I, th I think that's that's where we'll get farther. Just a little context. Anyone else? Marshall, thank you. That was really helpful and scary. <laughs> I, I will say that leads really well into the conversation about what the feds ask us to focus on and what contact points or discretion points as they um, refer to them as. So I'm happy to go into that to that detail now if that seems appropriate. Sure, you can. We have only one other item really on the agenda. So um, feel free to take, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. 
Okay, sounds good. I will do the overview of the JJRA and then go into context about some more of this data, um, some of which that uh, Marshall was just referring to. So, um, first of all, there's a lot of there were a lot of questions and a lot of conversation last um, month regarding um, what DCF is required to collect and then submit to the federal government. So, um, all of those requirements um, are stemming from one very specific uh, federal law, um, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, um, that has a, a huge amount of requirements included into it. Um, and ethnic and racial disparity work is one piece of that. Um, so what I'm gonna share is actually, I'm, I'm hoping that it'll just help um, for people who are visual learners as well, um, a review of, um, this is, I, I will be completely open. This is stolen from the federal government. <laughs> I won't say stolen, but they use this to train um, counter uh, all of those across the nation who do this work, um, myself included, and, and my counterparts in other states. Um, so I just snagged it directly from them. So um, the JJDPA was officially uh, first put um, into implementation in 1974. So this has been something that's been along for decades. Um, and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act was created as a part of the JJDPA. Um, and they're essentially focused to support local and state efforts in preventing delinquency and improving the JJ system. Um, and it's a part of the US Department of Justice. Um, this is just their vision statement. You guys don't need to see this, but this is a helpful visual to see how long this work has been a part of both Vermont's work, but also other states' work too. Um, so you'll see some some information here. These are other core requirements of the law that we don't need to go into detail about, but you'll see in 1988, in a reauthorization of this law, they first started referring to this work as disproportionate minority confinement. Um, and then the language has um, evolved over the years um, to disproportionate minority contact, and it is now racial and ethnic disparities. So this um, first original implementation of it in the in 88, um, it was because the JJRA was really focused on the disparities in secure confinement, and that has since evolved to think of other discretionary points similar to uh, the discretionary point that uh, Marshall was just referring to. Um, so I'm actually going to skip ahead a little bit um, and just go over what OJJDP asks states to do. So they have a three-stage model that they um, ask us all to um, implement. So one, we have to identify the problem that's gathering the data. Two, we have to develop an action plan to address that data. Um, and three, we're supposed to evaluate if we're having any success um, in essentially making any change in those data points. Oh, these are the five contact points that OJJDP specifically says that they want to see data on. Um, and these are points that they believe to have the most impact on youth. So to Marshall's point, um, those big 12 kids, um, OJJDP views that as one of the five contact points because they, they see exactly what Marshall was just saying about uh, the impact that it has on youth to be in adult court versus family. Uh, so they refer to it as transfer to adult court. Obviously we have um, direct file with those big 12. They also wanna see secure confinement and pretrial detention. Um, this, both of these are secure holdings. Um, in other states, it might look a little different. For us, this would, be the youth that were held in either two different ways um, previously at Woodside. Um, of course, uh, we no longer have Woodside as a secure juvenile facility in the state of Vermont, or they also wanna be seeing the data on when a police officer decides to uh, bring a youth back to their facility um, in the middle of the night and charge them. Um, it, the feds want to see um, the race data on whether or not those youth are being held securely at those facilities, right? So um, facilities might have a cuffing rail or a um, holding 
cell uh, that they might place that juvenile in while awaiting transfer to either a secure or a non-secure placement. And uh, currently, all of these law enforcement facilities do report data directly to DCF um, on those instances, and they include race data on that. So right now, that is the, the pretrial detention um, or the only pretrial detention in the state of Vermont. Um, if we're not including, of course, the small instances where we do have juveniles who are in DOC custody who have ended up at an adult um, facility. Uh, they wanna see arrest data. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Then they wanna see diversion data as well. Um, so they want us to do a three-stage reduction model. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm not sure you guys need to go into the detail of it. Um, but this is the definitions of each of these different contact points per OJJDP. Uh, the reason why I think this is particularly important to share with you all is because of the definition of arrest. Um, I think that this is, is pretty important. Um, OJJDP's definition is youth are considered to be arrested when law enforcement agencies apprehend, stop, or otherwise contact them and suspect them of having committed a delinquent act. Um, the delinquent acts are those if an adult commitment commits them would be criminal, including crimes against persons, crimes against property, drug offenses, crimes against public order. I think what's really important about this is OJJDP is saying that they understand that even if, um, say, a police officer stops a kid and says, hey, what are you doing? Uh, that If that doesn't result in anything, um, any kind of file, et cetera, there's still an impact on that kid. So OJJDP does view that as that youth being arrested. Um, so I find that incredibly important and wanted to point out to the rest of um, the rest of the panel. Um, I'm not sure necessarily we need to go into the other four um, definitions, um, but I'm happy to do so if there are any questions um, later on. Um, I'm going to switch, I'll pause and see if there are any questions and then I'm gonna switch to the ERD plan. Um, just given the amount of time we have. And I can't see hands, so if someone can let me know, that'd be great. I'm okay. looking. There are no hands up at the moment. Okay. So I'm going to start um, at the very beginning of this. So, um, this might answer some of the questions that Marshall is just pointing out. This is just the uh, juvenile population uh, separate into Burlington, Chittenden County, and then state of Vermont. Uh, this information is from something called Easy Pop, which is from the census, but it is a specific online. It's completely public uh, website. Um, if you if you Google Easy Pop, it's one of the first ones to pop up that OJJDP um, asks that states use when when creating this data, right? So these are the exact numbers according to the census. Obviously, they might not be necessarily incorrect. And then what we did is we also included the percentage in the Burlington School District because we have called out some data in this report that's specifically about Burlington. Um, and given that, we wanted to have that, that baseline information. So we see that, um, you know, Chittenden County does have, um, you know, slightly higher um, percentages of, of black youth um, than in the state, you know, five versus 3%, et cetera. So one thing I do wanna make clear about this um, and <laughs> something that you'll see, but I'll, I'll OJJDP has received, I, I will tell you a lot of feedback about, um, and I'll use the word anger about, about this requirement. We are not allowed to use RRIs. There might be some of you might have heard that phrase before. What they want us to be looking at is the percent of the race population um, that is arrested or the percent of that population that is diverted. So they want us to take the, um, the number of youth in, for instance, the entire state that are black and they want us to figure out how, what the percent of that population is that is arrested. So some numbers that I'll just um, make really clear here that just for sake of time that I think should be um, well acknowledged is, you know, we statewide only have a 3% rate of youth 
who are Black, and we have almost a 9% of statewide arrests. Uh, this is based on the National Incident-Based Reporting System, which actually Robin sends to me. Um, so I know Robin has left, but thank you to CRG for sending this information along. Um, and you can aggregate it by county as well. So we see a significantly bigger uh, discrepancy when we're looking at changing county based on the state. I think um, you know you can make your own analysis on based on why, but we see about 15% of Chittenden County arrests are um, black and only 5% as we know of the Chittenden County is black. And which, you know, it's three times as much. Of course, OJJDP doesn't want us to be referring to it as that, but um, we, we all can do that basic math. So this is the data that I typically will call out whenever somebody tries to tell me that we don't have disparities um, in our arrest rate. This is Burlington sends me this their data directly. This is over the course of three federal fiscal years. So keep in mind there, this is a continuous um, trend that we see um, year after year after year where 46% of their arrests are black youth. Uh, 46%, that is almost half. Um, I, I don't think there's much else I can say other than, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty disgusting. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave that there. Um, this is specifically for 18 and 19 year olds. Um, I separated them out for a, a pretty obvious reason, given race, the age, um, and this report, um, is before, you know, obviously 19 year olds aren't in our system yet, et cetera, but knowing that that we're gonna have both 18 and 19 year olds in our system um, next summer, um, separating those populations out. Interestingly enough, um, this doesn't have quite as bad disparities. Um, the reason why I say that's interesting is because national data has suggested that 18 and 19 year olds actually have the highest rate of disparities um, when it comes to arrests. Um, which so it's it's interesting to see that um, at least in Burlington that rate that rate does go down. So this is statewide court diversion referrals, um, just kind of the the quick and dirty. Um, we see that uh, for Black youth, um, about twelve percent of all of their of all the cases uh, for Black youth are diverted compared to about 31 or almost 32% um, of all white. Uh, we see uh, some also issues that you'll continue to see as we go along in this number of unknown. Um, there, there is quite a lot of um, youth um, data in the courts that currently says that their race is unknown, which is, which is a problem when you're trying to um understand how large the disparity is um when we have such small numbers so this is Chittenden county as well um obviously um we're looking we have the state information and this the Chittenden county as well um info separated out uh it's not quite as bad for Chittenden county at 9.8 percent um in comparison to that 12.9 white youth is about the same however. So this is for youth that were held at Woodside Juvenile Rehabilitation Center. Keep in mind this is the last year that this information is going to be included in this federal report. We no longer have uh, Woodside Juvenile Rehabilitation Center as a secure option in the state of Vermont. Um, what I will replace this with is the the race data of the youth who have been held securely both at Sununu, um, even though to be quite honest, OJJDP doesn't view those as our youth. They view those as New Hampshire's youth because they're being held in New Hampshire, but I will include it regardless. And um, I'll also include the information for the small number of youth that have been held um, in adult facilities um, since the closure of Woodside as well. Keep in mind, those are really, really small numbers. Um, however, at Woodside, we had about 17% uh, percent of the youth that were held at Woodside were black. Um, and as we know, only five, excuse me, 3% of our statewide population is black. 
So this um, it goes into those holding logs that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's the race of youth that are held securely by police. This is just for federal fiscal year 20. 20, um, and that's because we just started including this in this report, um, so I, I don't have the, the three-year aggregate, um, but essentially this is the decision that police make when they, br when they bring a youth back to their facility to either hold the youth non-securely, so if they have the youth just sitting in their lobby, you know, handcuffed to, to nothing, um, waiting transfer, that's, that's non-securely being held according to the federal government or at least the JJRA. Um, however, if they are held in a holding cell or if they are cuffed to a cuffing rail, the feds view that as a secure hold. Um, there's some other core requirements that they monitor regarding that, but um, this shows the instances statewide and also in Chittenden County of when the youth that are held securely are black. Um, Chittenden County, it is over, over half, um, so that means that law enforcement decide that those black youth should be held um, securely significantly more often than their white youth, um, their white counterparts. Um, and then statewide, it's about 25% of the time that a youth is held securely, that youth is black. And just to keep in mind, you know, the reason why the federal government wants to be, it wants to look at that information is because they understand that that is a trauma for youth to be held um, and locked up at what is a facility that is not designed for them. You know, these are these are small, often rural facilities in the middle of, of Vermont that are not that are not designed for to hold juveniles. They're designed to hold adults. So that is um, something that the feds monitor and acknowledge is is not best for kids to be held in. Elizabeth, I just want to say we we got to sort of wind it up. I, this is important, but we're yeah, kind no, of I, running out of time. The time. I will go super quickly through the next two pieces, and then we will we'll yeah. And I apologize. Um, youth delinquency positions filed eight percent black statewide, um, whereas only uh, seventy five. For white, um, Chittenden County, this is just the, the separated out. Uh, we see the percent of Chittenden County delinquency petitions are about 26 black, only 50% white. And this is the information that Marshall was highlighting earlier about those youth that are in the criminal division in comparison to families, so the big 12. Um, so we, uh, the data has changed a little bit. I think, Marshall, you were referring to uh, data from the previous report, um, but it is about 20% black um, in the most recent uh, three-year aggregate and um, in Shannon County, and then um, about seven in statewide. I will say, uh, you know, this does include some, some COVID data, so, you know, keep that in mind um, about some of this. Um, but I will stop sharing given that we have 10 minutes. I know, I know we're, we're stuck. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I want, in terms of going forward, I want to point out one of the things that I know which he's doing with his subcommittee, and we won't be hearing from him this evening, is he, you'll remember he was going to look for other reports, community safety reports from around the state similar to the one that was done in Brattleboro. And the idea was then that the subcommittee that he has would meet and pull out some themes from those that looked certainly of wide application, statewide application, and certainly in, you know provoke the interest of the people who are on the subcommittee. My suggestion is that we all do that. We've, with the last two months, pulled a lot of this stuff out. There's a lot floating around. Grant's done a great job of capturing all of that in the um, minutes. So I should think it would be fairly easy to go back and refresh our recollection about things that have been said. And I would recommend that we would meet as subcommittees between now and really like about a week before our next meeting in August. So I can pull together an agendum 
um, and we can take it from there. In other words, narrowing the discussion down a bit, not because we're narrowing it down, just because we are at that moment. We'll blow it back up again. You know that. We've done that a lot. But um, that would be my recommendation. Uh, any discussion on that? Okay. Ah, Rebecca. Uh, no discussion. Just a request, Elizabeth. Thank you for that. Uh, and I was, would you be able to share that that presentation with us? I, or I didn't see it in the queue. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm happy to. I can send the OJJDP um, overview. I, I'll also share which slides I was highlighting because there'll be a lot of other information in there, which I think is all good information for you to have. But I did, I did pull about ten of like forty slides from it. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, the last issue, and we really don't have a lot of time for it, but I'm going to simply highlight it, and uh, Rebecca, your, your hand is still up. Okay, that's just me. Sorry, my fault. Um, got it. Um, is the, you'll remember last month, um, Susanna brought forth a bunch of questions to us, which are in the minutes that we just approved regarding um, what the RDAP needs from this new division of racial justice statistics. That is captured not only in the minutes, but also um, in the body of Act 142 the enabling statute of this division itself. Um, you'll remember that in the letter that I sent out, I put a link to that act um, and asked people to refresh their recollections by looking through the minutes. Um, I would repeat that and ask that people do that so that we can have that discussion at the beginning of the meeting next month. All right. Um, one of the issues was um, how did we want the reporting from the division to come to the RDAP? I actually have some ideas on that, but I want to wait until we can have a broader discussion about it um, rather than just sort of squeeze it in in six minutes or four minutes. Excuse me, my math sucks. Um, I. So I just want to remind you that we have that to do um, for next time as well. Um, is there any new business? Okay, I see none. And of course, we already have a lot to do because we're going to meet as subcommittees. Um, the next meeting is on the 9th of August. Um, so that gives you a sense of how much time we have in which to meet as subcommittees. Uh, and that's really about it, I think, for tonight. Very full meeting, thank you very much. I thought that went really well. A lot came up that was really critical. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Good. Would anyone like to second it? I can second it, Sheila. Excellent. Thank you. Is there any further discussion that needs to take place? Seeing none, all in favor, please signify by aye or raise hands aye. or something. Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstaining? We are adjourning. And I will see you all um, and certainly talk to you long before the 9th but see you all on the 9th of August. Thank you very much for a great meeting.